there was a time I used to have an aversion to the word crisis, yeah. you know, and I think a lot of us do. We hear the word crisis, we think, oh God, you know. I actually have come to appreciate the word tremendously now for this reason, because if a crisis is present, if it's still present, it means we still have time to fix whatever it is that the crisis is calling our attention to. If the crisis is over, that means it's done. However it's going to be resolved, it's already happened and, and there's really nothing we can do. So the fact that we are in multiple concurrent simultaneous crises right now, for me is actually a good thing because it means those crises are calling our attention to something that needs that attention. And now the choice is, will we recognize that and will we embrace the fact that we are moving in, into a, a very different world? Yeah. I think probably the greatest crisis is the unspoken crisis. Bigger than climate change, bigger than the potential war in the Middle East that I believe doesn't have to happen and, and for very good reasons I think it won't. Uh, bigger than all of those, I think, Jennifer, it's, it's a crisis in thinking. Because until the people of the world have embraced the fact that the world of the past no longer exists and are willing to embrace the solutions and the ideas that support the, the new world, it's going to be very, very difficult to move into that world. This is uh, this is thing the media has so trumped up the things that are broken mm -hmm. and really hasn't recognized a lot of very good things happening in the world but the media has never come out and said in a big way BBC or CNN you know a special that the world of the past no longer exists. If we can do that in a broad general audience to a broad general audience then people can mourn the passing and let it go of a way of life and without that and I see these people every day of my life people there's a belief that the world was kind of chugging along everything was going well until something happened for some people it was 9-11 for some people it was the the economic crash uh, in uh, 08 and 09 but for those people there's a sense that all we need to do is get through the difficult time and the world goes back to normal and they're waiting for normal they put their lives on hold there are people that are are waiting to have children. They're not creating their families because they're waiting for the world to get back to normal. Or people that are have their, their career choices and their lives on hold waiting for us to come down the other side of a speed bump and return to a world that no longer exists. And those are the people that are suffering. They're suffering right now because they're clinging to an idea of a world that served us. And I'm not going to judge as right, wrong, good or bad. I have to say it works so well we're here. It got right, us here. Right, right. And now we know things now we didn't know in that world. And I think it serves us not to judge the past as a mistake or, or a good thing, but to say it was our path. And, and that we're on this huge learning curve. And now we know more than we have in the past. And with what we know, we can make new choices and move forward. And I think this is really the root of so much of the struggle people are having. If, because the world is changing, the way we live our lives is changing. The way we've thought of money in the past is changing, but nobody's told us that. The way we've thought of jobs and careers and security. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We no longer live in isolated nations, isolated economies. We don't have isolated resources. And it's very difficult for a single nation to make choices and decisions solely regarding their nation because we are so interconnected. For many people, they haven't really embraced this fact. We pushed globalism. The modern world pushed globalism on the world. The world bought it. And now that the world bought it, we're in this together. And that's why the thinking uh, regarding how we go about creating solutions and embracing the new ideas, uh, until that thinking is in, is in place, I, I sense that is, is a great crisis that we're living right now. You're talking about macro events, um, but you're also addressing the micro. And the micro with each individual on this call is about those folks embracing the, the crisis in their life and come with some new thinking, is that the idea? This is part of it, yes. And, and the big part of it is that we can no longer separate the micro from the macro. Where do you draw the line between the choices you make in your life and my life and what's happening in, in the big world out there? Mm -hmm. I was in the Yucatan uh, Peninsula uh, for about three weeks right before the end of the year, and, and I've, I've been there in the past. Spent a lot of time with the indigenous people in that part of the world, and they reflect in their beliefs uh, some of the principles that we find almost universally throughout the indigenous peoples. One of those things, Jennifer, is fascinating to me, is that they never separated what we would call science from spirituality, from everyday mm -hmm. life, mm -hmm. from the cycles of time. Right. Now think about how different our world would be if we did not separate science 
in spirituality, mm -hmm. in art, for example, and, and our everyday lives. It means that when, when we see something, when we look at something of beauty, and we feel that feeling within us, that feeling is actually changing the chemistry in our bodies. That's a science. To us, in the modern world, we've made this distinction. We say, oh, that's just art. You know, it's just a picture. When really, our presence with this piece of art, or I'm looking at a plant behind you right now, as, I, as I'm saying, is the beauty of those flowers. It's creating a feeling in me. That's changing my body chemistry. 1,300 biochemical reactions happening in my brain and my body and in response to an emotion that I'm having. And we've separated those things. They, they never separated the world from their lives. I think we're at a time where it's really difficult, we're challenged to draw a line between where our, our lives end and where the, the rest of the world begins. And the moment we, we draw that line, if we choose to draw one, we've fallen into the ancient trap that keeps us separated from the world and locks us into struggle because we have failed to recognize that our problems are the world's problems and vice versa. And it's, it's not about solving a few people's problems here. We're all in this together. And so we, we are learning now, I think, to, to see the world and ourselves in, in a different way. So what can I personally do to change my life and to change the, the macro from the micro? Uh, the world that we're living in right now is largely based upon scientific assumptions that have been made in the last 150 years. And science is good. I was trained as a science, scientist. Uh, I, I think science is useful, but science doesn't have all the answers. And this is, I think, the key. Uh, new discoveries, Jennifer, now show us where the thinking of the past, scientific thinking, is either inaccurate, some places is flat out wrong. Those new discoveries, the reason they're important is because we all, to answer your question, every one of us individually will solve the problems in our personal lives by looking at our relationship to the world through a lens of beliefs. And that lens is largely defined by science, either consciously or subconsciously, mm. in the modern world. So the beliefs, where does life come from? Where do we come from? Uh, what is our relationship to our bodies? Are we powerless over our bodies? Or do we, do we have the ability to communicate and heal with our bodies? What is our relationship to the world around us? What's our relationship to other people? What's our relationship to the past? How do we solve our problems? These are big, big questions every individual consciously or often subconsciously ask themselves, every nation, every civilization. Our answers have been based upon scientific principles that we now know are, are largely incorrect, that have led us to believe that life is random, human life is random, that we're separate from our bodies, we're separate from our world, that civilization is a one-time deal, that we're here at the pinnacle of this sophistication that's never happened before, and that conflict and competition is the way to solve our problems. That lens, and we, I'm not saying we get up every morning and look in the mirror and we have that conversation with ourselves and talk about it over breakfast, but it's, it's so deeply ingrained within us. And most of our listeners have probably been raised in a family or in a community where they've heard the term, we live in the dog-eat-dog -dog world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you believe that, that's the lens through which you will answer the question you asked me. What do I do about the job that disappeared? What do I do about my marriage that's collapsing, or my, my children that no longer know me, and what do I do about uh, my finances, and, and all, all of these things. We're solving the greatest crises that face the world and face us as individuals through the lens of a way of thinking that we now know is obsolete. New discoveries tell us that. The new discoveries, and we've shared this in past programs, tell us that life isn't random, that human life isn't random, that we're deeply connected to our bodies, we're deeply enmeshed within the systems of the earth itself, that civilization is cyclic. Uh, we've been here and we've achieved great things in the past, uh, if we have the wisdom to, to recognize that. And this is the big one, is that nature is based upon a model of cooperation and what is called mutual aid. Competition does happen in nature under specific circumstances, but it's not the rule of nature, and that changes everything. Mm -hmm. So, with that in mind, and that was very fast, but with that in mind, to answer your question, what do our, our listeners do? What, what can they do when they wake up in the morning? We all ask ourselves a question, again, subconsciously, or sometimes it's very conscious. We look at the world and we say, what can I get from the world that exists? And that's how we go about solving our problems based upon the false assumptions of science. The new discoveries now give us a reason to change that question. The new question 
rather than asking what can I get from the world that exists is what can I share with the world that's emerging? What can I contribute to the world that is, is emerging within my community, within my family, within myself? And the answer to that question, it's, it's subtle, and please listeners don't be deceived by the simplicity of that question because the way we answer that question opens the door to powerful, powerful possibilities, new ways of sharing our passions and our interests in the world, not just what we went to school to learn to do or just what our trade has trained us to do, but things that the world needs that we intuitively have picked up and learned on our own. And as we share those in a world that is now calling them forth, the flip side of that is that we are rewarded abundantly. Thank you.